And the Second Chess Clubhouse, they have a program where uh, people with mental health issues such as schizophrenia, bipolarism, depression, they create art such as paintings and they pl play music on the guitar. And um, well, they, they also have a, you know, a newsletter which uh, people write um, compositions, poetry, and such things of that nature. And so I was wondering, what sort of uh, bias does society have against the uh, people with disabilities trying to create art? I could just say to you that yes, there are biases against people who quote unquote don't belong, but everybody belongs. And your voice, that voice of those creative individuals are totally legitimate form of expressions, and they need to be validated. So I'm happy that there is a center for you. The, um, the politics as to how somebody gets marginalized and, and, and discredited are pretty real. And I guess the final answer is that, and I tell this to all of the artists that I work with and my community partners are working with community members, is really to find agency. Where does your voice have weight? Where can you change the dial, move the dial? How do you feel like you're empowered? So the work of empowering talent and empowering communities is kind of the work that I'm trying to do at my Arts Council. Thank you. Roberta, I'm so, um, I just want to say I think so much of this work is about really not only putting together the imaginary of what we can do now, but really asking people to take into account the history of a place itself. And that's so evident that you, you know, you send people through the archives or the organization and the, the invitation really takes people through the city itself to remember it um, as it has been and to really hope for the future that is far more equitable and engaged, um, you know, with everybody in it. So. Thank you very much for that wonderful well, uh, talk. And, no, and thank you. Only to, and I again apologize that I had the wrong time in my mind. So I was from another planet right now. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. you. You got to model or let's watch it talk. It was beautiful. Perfectly beautiful. So we have the um, results from the last question that was posed to you. Um, and we see that there is a lot of agreement that art should be for everyone. Um, the next question is, does broadening access to art mean quality is lessened? And it will actually be during the first panel presentation. Um, Roberto, I think you've given us so much to think about and given us so many terms and so many provocative ways of sort of engaging this work today, which is about engagement and the relationships we establish through our work. Um, I want to invite the panel to the stage, please. Um, everyone here, let's see, Reginald, um, we'll have uh, the responders, Reginald Adams. Oh, I'm sorry, I have one thing to do. There is a break up, break out session, <laughs> a small group session about current alt models will be starting in the Space City Room just down the hall on your right. So if you are interested in joining this breakout group, please make your way to the Space City Room down the hall. Okay. And next, may I invite to the stage uh, the panel for the next presentation. And I'm actually gonna switch mics now because I move. On the schedule overview on the uh, first page you'll see that there are three breakout sessions happening today and the first one is alt models the second one will be called targeted power and problems of demographic allure and the third will be called college of the arts the future of university of houston arts can you see 
right here next to Sixto's statement in the day-long schedule. And I'll be reminding you about those breakouts throughout the day. Thank you. Um, I am not going to be able to introduce all the responders. I want, we want to maximize time uh, today, but I'd like to say their names. Reginald C. Adams, Debbie McNulty, and Michelle Mower. Is that correct? All right, thank you. Um, still looking for Reginald. I saw him earlier. OK, he'll be here. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Sandra Zalman, who will be the presenter today. Um, this panel is actually on the democratization of art. Uh, Dr. Sandra Zolman is assistant professor of art history at the University of Houston, where she specializes in modern and contemporary art. Her research develops out of a broad interest in the interplay between high and low forms of the visual. She is particularly interested in the ways diverse institutions frame modern art for public consumption, ranging from museums and world's fairs to department stores, movies, and popular magazine. Her forthcoming book offers an analysis of how surrealism's vernacular and avant-garde status influenced the direction and reception of American art. Her research has been supported by grants from the American Council of Learned Studies, the American Association of University Women, and the Andy Warhol <coughs> Foundation for Visual Arts. Please welcome Sandra Zolman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank Sixto um, for inviting me here. And I also want to thank my colleagues, Josh Fisher and Rachel Hooper, for a stimulating conversation about this topic in advance of my presentation. I'm really excited to be talking about democratization in the arts. And because my research deals with museums and how they frame modern art for public consumption, I'm going to approach this from an institutional perspective. And you'll notice from a historical perspective, because I'm an art historian, I'm not going to fight it. Okay, <laughs> so arguably the most influential museum in determining how the American public understands modern and contemporary art is the Museum of Modern Art in New York. MoMA was one of the first museums in the US to actually think about how to get more people interested in art. In its early years, MoMA did shows called Machine Art, where curator Philip Johnson not only displayed industrial mass-produced objects in an aesthetic context, but even conducted audience polls to determine the most popular works. MoMA was the first museum in the country to establish an architecture and design department, a film department, and in 1940, a photography department. But in 1959, the Museum of Modern Art filed a lawsuit against the socialite Huntington Hartford, who was heir to the massive A&P grocery fortune. Hartford had recently announced his intention to build a museum in Manhattan that he would call the Gallery of Modern Art. Oops, sorry. There's Hartford. Okay. He wanted to build this thing called the Gallery of Modern Art. And MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, wanted to prevent Hartford from using the words modern art in naming his new museum because it felt that Hartford's version of modern art was in direct conflict with its own. So instead of he heeding prevailing critical opinion about what constituted modern art, Hartford personally financed the $7 million effort, that's $52 million in today's dollars, um, to create an institution that he felt would be an alternative to the abstract, by which he meant elitist, version of modernism that he felt that MoMA was promoting. His museum was going to showcase figurative, non-abstract, moral art. So this is MoMA. This is the Gallery of Modern Art. It's still there. It's still in New York City today. It's on Columbus Circle. It's now the Museum of Arts and Design. You may have been there. Not only did Hartford call his museum the Gallery of Modern Art, but its construction by the same architect less than a mile from MoMA demonstrated that Hartford intended his museum to directly compete with the cultural cachet that MoMA had come to embody in its 35-year existence. MoMA's lawsuit raises the question, who determines the boundaries of modern art? Ironically, it was MoMA that originally wanted to keep the idea of modern art flexible. In 1941, Alfred Barr, the first director of MoMA, noted that the truth is that modern art cannot be defined with any degree of finality, either in time or character. 
Barr recognized that the history of modern art was ongoing, and thus the museum's mission needed to be broad and democratic to encompass all new developments. MoMA actively promoted public understanding of art's integration into modern life. Uh, it encouraged tie-ins with department stores. What I'm showing you is a catalog for a show that MoMA did, and then a department store window at Baumwitt Teller, where the catalog is actually included in the department, you know, in the window display. And Barr liked this kind of stuff. Um, MoMA also hosted a series of exhibitions called Youthful Objects. And they, these were intended to promote public proficiency in modern tenants via household objects or shopping. I actually think they're just shopping. Um, Barr's book, What is Modern Painting, was expressly aimed at the man on the street. And the Museum of Modern Art Bulletin even advised its readers on the most stylish toasters to buy. Um, so I, I, use, I bring up all of these things because I think they're examples of this idea that art can be for anybody. Like, you may not be able to buy a Picasso, but you can certainly buy the right toaster. So, Barr was so committed to vernacular art alongside the avant-garde that in 1942, he okayed the display of a shoe shine stand decorated by an Italian boot blacker. The MoMA press release highlighted Joe Malone's shoe shine stand as a piece of art. Quote, completely encrusted with gay baubles and brilliant ornaments gathered over a period of years from push carts and five and dime stores. Barr described it as jubilant as a circus wagon, and he set it up in the lobby of MoMA. Unfortunately, Barr was fired the following year for his democratic version and vision of modernism. Oops. And by the later 1950s, where? Ah, that's the slide I want. By the later 1950s, so after Barr, the director, has been fired, MoMA seemed in sync with abstract expressionism and cubism and the critically acclaimed avant-garde. Meanwhile, Hartford conceived his new museum to address the gulf between public and critical opinion. In 1956, he had paid for a full-page ad, which looked like a news article, um, called The Public Be Damned, and he had it printed in six New York newspapers. Hartford implored people to decide for themselves what their opinions of the arts were by standing up to, quote, the high priests of criticism and the museum directors and the teachers of mumbo jumbo, of which I consider myself to be one. <laughs> Hartford saw himself, again, as standing up for the regular people by challenging the art establishment. But Hartford also framed his ideas of art in moral terms, as a battle between liberty and dictatorship, the free world and communism. And like many uh, conservatives of his day, Hartford discerned communist politics at the root of, quote, the diseases which infect the world of painting today, of obscurity, confusion, morality, and violence. So instead of cubism and abstract expressionism, Hartford advocated realism and beauty. Art critics and, uh, and politicians recognized that Hartford's demands on modern art could amount to a form of censorship. Eleanor Roosevelt published an article denouncing Hartford's attempt to buy public opinion and defended modern artists' right to experiment. Hartford was also not the first to frame modern art in terms of its ideological implications. American politicians in the 1940s and 50s, most famously Representative George Dondero, launched attacks on modern art as uh, communistic propaganda. Alfred Barr then defended uh, modern art as a political freedom. Um, this, I'm showing you a 1952 New York Times article by Barr, in which Barr pointed out that, in fact, it was the Soviet and fascist regimes who condemned modern art. So there's actually a really interesting irony here going on where, uh, on the home front, congressmen were saying that modern art was communist, and abroad, the CIA was actually promoting modern art as an example of American democracy and liberal ideals. So, by deciding to open his own museum, Hartford jumped into these debates on an institutional level. The lawsuit was eventually settled out of court, and the new museum was going to be called the Gallery of Modern Art, including the Huntington Hartford Collection. Hartford was not pleased about that, uh, because he said, I want this gallery to stand on its own two feet, he said. Anybody's name on a semi-public building of this kind is bad, even Abraham Lincoln's. 
So Hartford's attempt to suppress the private nature of his enterprise um, uh, shows, I think, that he realized he could mount a more credible critique of MoMA by framing his effort as an institutional one rather than an individual position. The issue of the museum's role in public life was very much at the forefront of discussion in the 1960s. In Art in America's 1961 special feature on museums, the new director of the Guggenheim wrote that museums were more and more becoming cultural combat zones. Quote, contemporary museums in particular are battlefields where forms are the weapons and the spoils, the means and the end. MoMA recognized that the perception of the museum by the public was crucial to its work, even before the rise of what we now sort of call the blockbuster era which is generally considered to have begun in the mid-1960s. Perhaps one of the first blockbusters in the US was the display of the Mona Lisa in 1963 at both the National Gallery of Art and New York's Metropolitan Museum. Under attack for being elitist, museums began to reconsider their civic responsibility and reinvented themselves as populist institutions. Blockbuster exhibitions, the exhibitions that are intended to attract over 250,000 visitors, play to popularity, and so they often also end up recirculating the same artists year after year after year. If you've been to a big Impressionism show lately, uh, that's sort of what I'm talking about. So they, they tend to promote what's already popular instead of introducing the public to less well-known work. The blockbuster is ultimately a gambit in which the museum aims to get more people in the doors and expose them to art, so that's good. But other people argue that the seeming democratization of art brought about by the blockbuster is an illusion. The huge crowds attending the exhibition and the hype surrounding it mean that visitors are unable to have a meaningful experience. And blockbusters rarely tackle difficult art. It is, of course, significant that the concept of the crowd-pleasing blockbuster exhibition developed during the same period when museums needed to attract more corporate sponsorship. So what is the ideal of democracy in the arts? Today, museums crowdsource the selection of exhibitions and curators exchange ideas with visitors on social media. Last year's Museum Selfie Day garnered, sorry, this, this year's Museum Selfie Day garnered thousands of tweets and generated audience engagement with art. Though, of course, the question deserves to be asked, what kind of experience are museum visitors having? We want the museum to feel like an open and accessible center for civic life. But these same institutions sometimes work best through somewhat anti-democratic means. The expert opinions of those who are trained in the academy, uh, perhaps in art history and the visual arts, etc. Perhaps the most famous museum selfie, uh, though I debate whether this is actually a selfie because they didn't take it themselves, um, is this photo of Beyonce and Jay-Z posing in front of the Mona Lisa. Beyonce and Jay-Z are marshalling the painting and especially their proximity to it as a code for high culture. And the museum in turn is using the celebrity of Beyonce and Jay-Z to make itself seem ever more populist. Of course, there's again layers of irony here because non-celebrity visitors would never ever be allowed this close to this particular painting. Um, but it's an interesting kind of intersection of how museums want to seem less elitist, less high culture, and how celebrities want to seem more high culture. To return to Hartford's museum, the public initially flocked to the Gallery of Modern Art. In addition to the middle-aged and prosperous-looking patrons were also large numbers of college-aged youths. One reviewer compared the flood to Macy's at Christmas. Although created to appeal to the taste of the general public, Hartford closed the gallery in 1969, just five years after it opened. Hartford's attempt to challenge the art establishment on behalf of common culture raises important questions about the way the public consumes modern art but I think his failure is even more telling. It seems to indicate a certain respect for the authority of experts. The avant-garde is not a democratic idea unless we reflect on the aspect of democracy that highlights, alongside majority rule, the importance of preserving individual freedoms. Ideally, a museum can provide a space that protects dissident voices that the majority may never agree with. Thank you.
testing. Okay, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, thank you all for coming out this morning. Uh, this is it's so encouraging to see so many um, people from the film community here. It's it's interesting because I often go to these uh, these larger arts events and I rarely still see filmmakers in the audience and uh, so I see a handful out here so I, I want to thank you all for coming out and being a part of this because ultimately this is what we are. Uh, we're, we're artists and and I think that the idea of democratization is, uh, at least in the film world, is not necessarily a new concept, it's one that's been coming for a long time but it's heavily, it has been heavily reliant on access to technology. And uh, there's a there's been a long time conversation about you know is film art what makes art what doesn't make art just like any any art form you know we have our blockbusters too <laughs> and oftentimes those are the uh, the films that get focused on and uh, and traditionally uh, the access to an audience has been very uh, very minimal it's been very you know it's almost been very exclusive to certain uh, certain people who managed to get through uh, the the uh, corporatized gatekeepers of the film world so those who are artists uh, film film artists specifically had rely had to rely on museums had to rely on local nonprofit arts organizations to get their work out there through the art house circuit and I think what's interesting now is that the, uh, the filmmaker, the artist, has more access to their audience than ever before. And that's wonderful, that's amazing. The problem is anyone can get out there and make anything and put it, put it on, online or wherever. So the challenges before were getting through the gatekeepers to get your work seen the challenge now is getting recognized in that you know it's it's a needle in a haystack. Your project is a needle in a haystack, and uh, it's getting it, you know, getting it out there so that people would you know will look for it. And uh, you know we live in the age of YouTube where basically that's the uh, the film version of the selfie. <laughs> Anyone can go out there and make anything and put it online and you know call it art, I guess. And and uh, and that's great and it's wonderful that they're able to do that. Uh, but at the same time, it makes I think a little bit more difficult for the viewing, the audience to, to find, you know, some of the quality work that, that's being um, being distributed through that means. So for me, the the the, the idea of being of democracy in, in film, in particular, is about um, is about allowing anyone, regardless of their experience level, with you know, regardless of their you know, backgrounds, their, uh, you know, socioeconomic backgrounds, their um, ethnicity, whatever. Anyone can pick up a camera and it's equal playing field. And that has almost never been the case in the film industry before. And now it is. Uh, it's, it's interesting that I don't know of any other, maybe it, I, I just don't, I'm not aware of it, but I'm not sure of any other industry that is comprised of so many artists but it is still so uh, so uh, capitalist, you know, so driven by by monetary uh, by the monetary. And now the you know the industry is afraid of the little guy because now they're having to compete with the little guy, and that's never happened before. So I think it's really interesting times as a filmmaker. But ultimately, I think what democratization means is it, one of my mentors who, I don't know if she's here, I was just getting in the room, I don't see her, Casey Kelly, once said that we, we all as human beings have an inherent need to be, to have a voice and to be heard in one way, fashion, or another. Whether you're a filmmaker, whether you're a writer, whether you're a painter, whether you're a dancer, it doesn't matter. You, you want to express yourself in some way and you want people to to feel something or to get something out of that expression, to learn something, to you know, to be enlightened or just to, to to get to know you a little bit better. You know, whatever your purpose for wanting to get your voice out there is absolutely valid, and it's and it's wonderful that we now have that ability to do that. Um, but our challenge is as a 
I think as a community of, of artists is to make sure that we're promoting not just ourselves, but all of us together as a group in order to let those, those artistic voices really rise and become recognized uh, in the broader haystack, <laughs> so to speak, and, and so that we can all benefit and that our, hopefully our collective, you know, our collective uh, voices will benefit. So, thanks. So many of you all know me through the Museum of Cultural Arts Houston, um, AKA MOCA, and it was very much built upon the idea of uh, democratizing art. Um, when we started the organization a little over 16 years ago, it was uh, with the notion that we could put the public into public art. Uh, my experiences, really having traveled around the world, was that a lot of times the pieces that I saw, the work that I saw, in, whether it be rural communities or in metropolitan areas, were very much created or co-created by the people who lived around that work, and that was fascinating to me. But then when I came back to Houston, I oftentimes saw that work would be placed in uh, tourist-driven communities where there was a very nominal relationship that the work may have with the actual community. And so personally, as an artist, it was uh, of interest to see how we could integrate and re-engage uh, the public in that creative process. And this was happening at the same time I was watching the arts be pretty much extracted out of the public education system. And I think we all know the, the value of arts. We don't have to tell that story, be preaching to the choir. But if we speak to democratizing art, then we have to talk about how are we bringing arts back into our children's lives? And how important it is for young people to have that voice. Michelle spoke to you know, the inherent need for us to express ourselves. And yet, in our schools, we see uh, that ability to speak freely and openly, creatively, uh, pretty much being minimized, almost to the extent of non-existence. So uh, my work is really about uh, what can we do to not only expose uh, our public, particularly youth, to the arts, but also engage them in that creative process. I have a philosophy around um, creating, innovating, and inspiring. And I think, you know, as humans, we're naturally creators. We don't even think about it, but right now our bodies are, are recreating ourselves. They're, they're duplicating and cells are dying off and, and rebuilding themselves. And so that's just a part of us that we can't even get away from, whether we're artists or not. Uh, but then there's the, the element of innovation, and it's looking at the way we've been doing things and the way our society has been structured and seeking new and uh, unusual ways in which we can bring creativity to the public. And I think that's really what democratize, de, excuse me, democratizing art is about, is bringing uh, this creative experience to people who otherwise wouldn't see themselves as artists or wouldn't come to a traditional art institution. And then it's a matter of inspiring, because I think we all have a part to play in uh, finding those who may need hope or may need to see that they have value in society. And I've seen it across the board through many disciplines, uh, not just visual art, but through music. Uh, I love the work that uh, David LaDuca is doing with uh, children with special needs and the work that Michelle Barnes is doing uh, in urban communities and the work that uh, Shannon Buzz is doing with poetry. And I think this is what this is all about, is bringing uh, our ability to show young folks and just the general public the importance and the power that creativity has on not just being an artist, because that's great, it provides us with aesthetics and things to listen to and watch and see, but at the same time, it makes us better people. Uh, when we see communities that are infused with art, these tend to be more holistic and sustainable communities. When we travel throughout the world and you find very creative destinations, these tend to be places where people tend to get along a little better with each other. So I see the democratization of art not only as a, a means for bringing aesthetics and, and the beauty of art to our cities and our communities, but it's also uh, a way of life that we should adapt to build new bridges between cultures and communities that have oftentimes been separated through barriers 
and bridges that are oftentimes built by um, the power structure to divide and conquer these people. So I'm very excited about this conversation today and to be able to share at least uh, my perspective on uh, what we can do to continue embracing the arts and involving people who may not be in this room because we're all creatives in some type. But I think the real challenge is how do we take this conversation to the streets? How do we take this conversation to our policy makers and decision makers, uh, to those thought leaders that are creating policy that's formed what happens in our schools and in our neighborhoods? Uh, and that's what I'd like to see happen next, is that this conversation extend beyond these walls and really into the broader community. Thank you. I'm not sure. Okay, this is very intimate. Um, so this topic reminded me of an article I read uh, quite a while ago um, by John Kreidler, a program officer for many years at the San Francisco Foundation, and it was titled Leverage Loss. And it was one of those articles that sort of shifted my thinking about things. I'm not sure I agree with everything, uh, but it did, it was thought provoking. Um, and often new information about your history can sort of change your perspective on things in your personal history and certainly in your field of work. And this article has been cited in a lot of um, publications looking at cultural policy. And it has a pretty informative picture about how our uniquely American arts and cultural ecosystem developed into what we have before us today by dividing the system in, uh, in its development into pre-Ford Foundation era and post-Ford Foundation era. So pre-Ford from the Industrial Revolution to 1957, um, and I'm just gonna give you some highlights from the article, it's, it's pretty nuanced. Um, the arts, Kreidler suggests, the arts operated relatively straightforward, market-based, and in a proprietary system where all income was naturally earned. The proprietary system was very sensitive to customer uh, demand because it was the only way it existed. Um, and often, not just customers, but threat of imprisonment and even more severe consequences. Um, were enacted on uh, artists and arts groups at that time, in early times. Um, so arts practitioners had to make sure they were bringing their audience with them to advance their form, try new things, challenge convention. Um, Kreidler notes a number of social and technological changes and advances that began to shift the ground for the arts in the pre-Ford era, uh, with things like the rise of public education, uh, increases of leisure time brought on by the labor movement and other things. Um, and as technology developed new tools like movies, large numbers of people began to shift consumption patterns. And around this time, it was um, when the nonprofit model began to emerge for the high arts uh, with governance um, by boards of directors. So being cut off from much of its consumer base, the subsidized nonprofit organization emerged almost exclusively for the high arts. In the late 1950s, the Ford Foundation invented the arts grant and the concept of the matching grant at the same time as a way to leverage um, other giving. And Kreidler describes it as a cascade of foundations, corporations, and governmental agencies um, came into funding the arts. Um, this also led to the formation of the National Endowment for the Arts and dramatically changed uh, the formation of virtually all new high art enterprises into the nonprofit versus the proprietary model. So subsidy greatly freed the arts from consumer concerns and art forms advanced without necessarily having to bring their segments, their audience with them, large segments of the public. Um, there also developed a generation 
of Ford era arts workers um, with an unprecedented number of new organizations, not because of financial reward or market opportunity, because they had the training and the desire to do so that was satisfied by a subsidy system that now existed. There is also a threat about the willingness of arts workers to discount their labor um, that I recommend checking out. Um, so the big point there is that the principle of leverage can only work if there's unlimited growth of resources. And since that's not the case, uh, funding leverage is unsustainable. Um, Kreidler suggests some contraction in the sector is a realistic outcome. Um, and further, that the arts will have to adapt to the conditions of less discounted labor and less contributed income. And I suggest sort of bringing it back to the topic of democratization, which I don't care for that word. Um, <laughs> it, will, it will be the, the groups that can effectively cultivate and respond to consumer demand and advance their artistic um, risk taking at the same time that will be in the best position to succeed. So shifting to the arts and cultural plan um, that Sixto wanted me to talk about and the question of what has been the input from the community, the community input is foundational and critical. Uh, I believe this is essential to the success of the plan. It's a belief held by the entire consulting team. It, the plan will be informed by the perceptions, opinions, desires of the community, as well as best practices and assessment of the city's current strategies for investing in cultural life. Uh, it's led by the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs, and I know Manette Basil is here today. Um, we are building off existing research. We're taking uh, surveys um, and existing research and supplementing that with interviews, focus groups, a website, and um, um, uh, public meetings. So you have an intercept survey that we've given you today. If you haven't filled one out, please do. You can give that to me or to Manette. Um, and we would really appreciate that feedback. Um, there's a large community advisory committee that is, can, includes people uh, from all different sectors of our city, and it is also gender and racially and ethnically diverse. Um, the findings that the consulting team has heard from the community so far in all of these meetings and interviews um, were discussed at the town talk hall meeting that we had recently and largely affirmed. And they are equity in the distribution of the city's arts grants, sustainability of mid-tier organizations, access to the arts in neighborhoods, space needs and real estate cost pressures, updating the civic arts program, and the overall city arts program structure. In May, we expect the consulting team will have most of its assessment complete and we'll have draft strategies to put out to the public for comment. So if you want to know more about the plan, you can go to the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs website and see all the presentations that have been made um, and notes from the advisory committee meetings. And if you would please help us in our online website in responding to topics and polling and posting your ideas and questions at buyucity.org, that's B-Y-Y-O-U-City.org, by you, the community. <laughs> we would really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you to all our speakers um, on the subject of democratization and the many ways we can think about this. Um, I'm particularly moved by the Kreidler example. It's really interesting. Um, that article has been published three or four times. It can be found on the Grant Maker in the Arts website, K-R-E-I-D-L-E-R, -E -E John. Um, and um, he also says that, you know, by and large, most income for arts is earned income, um, that we forget that, you know. A lot, and that all, and it's um, interesting to think about that in terms of some of the findings from last year's summit. Because remember, for last year's summit, we started with a um, the Center for Houston Futures report on Houston, and the actual whereas Kreidler is anticipating 
there's going to be this drop in the number of nonprofits because right up until the 1990s, it's just exponential the growth. Um, we're actually seeing again huge growth in the number of nonprofits in Houston. And one of the points in last year's report was that Houston was, I think, just behind San Antonio and Dallas or something like that. But yeah. Yeah, but it was still, like, the, the number was amazing to me. What it, I can't even remember it at this point. Um, it does show that there is, within the social sector, something that people feel has not been met. And that there are still needs and resources um, we need to be marshalling. And I, I think these are sort of big guiding questions. What, what are the things we still need to respond to? And, and when does it exceed the bottom line? And when is it over-reliant upon the artist to marshal all forces and require um, just that much more extra support and organization all around? Um, we have any questions from the audience? We, we have a pretty good time right here where we can engage in discussion. We can take up some of the provocations from Roberto's talk earlier today. Um, we have one already out there. Um, I have many questions, but the one that uh, stood out for me the most was, uh, uh, why, why do you have a problem with the word democratization and the concept? Because it's very difficult to say when you're nervous. <laughs> Berto? Thanks for a great panel and Roberto for your talk. I was actually wondering maybe if Sandra and Roberto could begin the dialogue and then the rest of the panel in terms of, because you're both addressing this question of what might be called avant-garde practices or difficult practices that by nature are deemed to be anti-democratic, not, but not necessarily so in the way that you framed it. And in the case of Roberto, you come from a personal practice as a poet dealing with uh, particular scenes in San Francisco that were largely exclusionary, but because of their commitment to avant-garde uh, ethos, and uh, an avant-garde ethos. So I was wondering if you could at least address that and then how this plays out in terms of policy, because it seems to me that in the city of Houston there are um, artist-run spaces that are uh, committed to work that, uh, that is challenging and that also addresses questions of belonging without uh, a, a sort of preconceived notion of what constitutes the popular or what constitutes the difficult. Okay, uh, thank you, Roberto, for that question. And I think in talking about that, I could also respond a little bit to Susanna's question as well, which is that I think there's the, the idea of democratization in the arts is complicated for me because it almost sounds like it wants to turn art into a popularity contest. And I don't think that that's necessarily the best direction for museums or other arts institutions to go in. Um, that the avant-garde is difficult. It's intentionally going against mainstream culture um, and trying to find this uh, perhaps sub-cultural uh, space in which to make very provocative points. Um, so it, it's not going to be democratic, again, in this general way that we think about democracy. Um, and I was hoping to highlight that in my talk, that, that democracy means majority rule, and that's sort of how we conceptualize it. Um, but it also means that there is protection for minority rights. And I would consider the avant-garde a, a kind of minority. Um, so, you know, it's in the, the example that I was talking about with Huntington Hartford is really ironic, of course, because he is the 1%, and he's building this big museum to challenge another big museum, also you know, funded by the Rockefeller. So it's really this war of billionaires. Um, but it's framed as you know, somebody speaking for the common man. And even if that person is a 1% you know, billionaire white guy. Um, and so I find it really interesting that in the end, he, he didn't succeed. And so I do think there's something to do with high culture, that people still like it, um, and they don't necessarily, I'm going to be provocative. I don't know if people want museums to be democratized. I think people often go to museums to um, have something on another level, on a, you know, again, that, that idea of high culture. 
They don't want the museum to be a space of mass culture, because you can go to the mall for mass culture. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe leave it at that, and that I, I think there's a special place, uh, a special role for the arts where you know, we can give voice to the avant-garde um, and, and see how that plays out. Okay. Um, kind of respond to that and respond to that, and Debbie, too, some comments that you, you mentioned. Uh, in the Canadian context, uh, there's a Canadian poet, I'll start off with poetry, I mean Robin Glazer, he's gone, uh, he's wonderful, but in the Canadian context, artists were involved at the cultural policy table because it's so state-driven. Uh, and he has, I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase his comments about, the artists are involved in composing the world. And the composing is an entanglement of men and women in heaven and earth. He's speaking like a poet. And I think that that really, and he was avant-garde. I mean, he was a brilliant poet um, and admiring spirit. But in some ways, where I go to metaphor um, is that language of we. And is the museum a, a home of a we? It's a real question. And in cultural policy and democracy, I mean, I'm all about deliberative democracy. I want everybody to make that we. I, you know, representational democracy, you go and you vote and you got somebody and they do it. But the, the whole process of cultural policy making, you talk about it, where's the agenda set? Who is doing the agenda set? Is the mayor's office doing the agenda set? Are you doing the agenda set? Is the community sitting there telling you all their needs and then making that agenda? The, the deliberative democracy part is that agenda setting part, that decision making part. So, and in some ways, in the museum world, you know, I, I, you know, it's big. I used to work at the Getty. I know how like authoritarian it can be, and that validation systems are really interested, embedded in all of kind of the work we do. So, that's a response. Reginald, did you want to respond at all? I mean, your talk so much was about it. I think both you and Michelle had talked about, you know, access. And well, I'll share an experience that I had the last week. So, so I'm at uh, the Ralph Lauren store in the Galleria for a fundraiser for Big Brothers Big Sisters, and the young lady who it's a private event, so they have the store shut off from from the public. And the young lady who's kind of taking names and checking RSVPs, she has on these uh, tattered jeans with paint splattered all over. And so I thought, wow, you know, I said, you, you're an artist. She goes, no, this is one of our hottest lines. <laughs> and I thought it was really fascinating. So I go in and, you know, meeting and greeting, and I ask one of the, uh, the sales reps, like, so where, where are those jeans? I really love to see a pair. <laughs> and he goes, wow, let me take you over. I think we have like one pair left. We can't keep these jeans in the store. And they're $200, right? And I thought, how fascinating. We're, we're selling the perception of creativity and art. Right, and yet I have about 20 pairs of those jeans at home, and you know I actually ch went home and changed clothes because I thought that I would be inappropriately dressed if I wore my painted on jeans. So I think it's really interesting how art, in and its in and of itself, is being popularized whether we want it or not, and do the artists really have control over any of that, and are we the benefactors of some of that popularization of art? So I just wanted to share that. I don't know if it has anything to do with this conversation, but I thought it was pretty interesting. Uh, I, I just wanted to mention something you said, you mentioned earlier about the um, proliferation of the nonprofit. You know, I've been involved with an organization here in Houston for 10 plus years, I'm not gonna say how long. Uh, I was employed with uh, Southwest Alternate Media Project Swamp. Mary Lampy was my boss, best boss ever. And, uh, and I, um, you know, I'm now a board member of Swamp. And it's interesting because I've seen a number of new nonprofits emerge in the film, film world. And my question to just the arts community at large is, is, is it, are some of these arts organizations, uh, these nonprofit organizations, are they being created as a way to address something that's missing in the community? Or is it something else? And I think the key question we should be asking is, what are these new organizations bringing to our community that isn't being brought already. And trying to have that conversation about, about 
figuring out how to serve the uh, how to cultivate audiences, but also how to serve them in a way that there is just not completely confusing, <laughs> you know. And and I think in, in a lot of ways, you know, if you have a, all these nonprofits coming out, they're all kind of doing the same thing. Nobody's really bringing anything new to the community. Is that really helping us? I don't I don't know. I mean, I maybe maybe not. I mean, you know, for film, it's kind of a new thing, so it's maybe the jury's out on that. But but my question is is that how do we drive that conversation to make sure that we're not that we're not just you know working all kind of working in fractured ways without coming together to to be that that unifying voice for the community for our specific art forms right. i'm hearing two real interesting provocations you know one is lead with the art um you know is coming up a lot with you know so that it's not just monetized or commercialized and taken from the artist and that there the other is a mindset of, of community first what are these relationships that are happening um, that make people feel vested in the heart Hi, um, I the whole avant-garde part really struck me, and I'm so glad you brought it up because, to me, it's not avant-garde until a very privileged elite says it is. Until then, it's crazy or a hustle, and you're just getting over it. And as I am trying to raise my children, they're 13 and nine, and expose them to all of this high art and the avant-garde and all of that, they don't care, and they don't get it, and they're not interested until they see Jay-Z and Beyonce at the Louvre, and then they're like, oh yeah, let's do that. Let's go where they are. And I had a total mommy fail moment last night where we're watching Black Girls Rock, and my daughter's like, where's Beyonce? Why? This isn't important until Beyonce's there. We had to go through a very long conversation about how she's not relevant to everything. <laughs> but. What I am concerned about as we talk about democratization of art is how we get youth engaged. Because their voices are not in these rooms. We are a very privileged group of people who have a lot of education that has allowed us to get to the point where we're talking about all of this. But in getting young people into the spaces of art and getting them connected to it to the point where they want to make it, where they want to talk about how their city is going to produce it for years on end, we haven't figured that out, and I'm very curious as to what we're going to do to make sure that the next generation is involved in this conversation, even if they don't come with the credentials that the rest of us have in this room. So I'd like some response to that. Okay. I see someone here. You had your hand up. The red sweater. Do you want to go? <laughs> it's not in no way related to what she said. I think that warrants a response, though. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, so it speaks to one of my comments earlier, and that was how we just allow the arts, for the most part, to be extracted out of our school systems, right? And, and 10, 15 years from now, it may not even be that long, we're gonna be wondering what the hell happened to these kids? Like, why, are, why do we have decision makers who don't care about the arts? Well, because we're breeding them to not care about the arts. And so I think one of the biggest challenges that I personally feel responsible for is to go into schools that I know don't have any kind of creative art programming and do something. Right? Because we, as Shannon mentioned, we all are probably overexposed to creativity. But what are we doing to take it to, the, to those who have it the least and need it the most? And I think that's a personal challenge that I would ask that we leave this room with, is just to think about that. Because ultimately, those will be the kids who are owning businesses, sitting at boardrooms, talking about how creativity or the lack thereof will be infused into their cities. And if they've never been exposed to it as children, uh, God forbid they're not going to embrace it as adults. So, well, I just, yeah, it's the, um, the challenge of uh, civic engagement, public engagement, um, you know, we have seen this through the arts and cultural plan, of course, there was no system at the city, no practice of regular meetings with the community. So inventing a structure to do that, inviting people to come is wonderful if they actually come. Um, so the getting people's attention on issues that are critically important to their future takes time and effort and work. In the school system, um, this has probably been one of the most uh, popular, constant, questions that have come through the city's cultural planning process that I have heard, that the entire team has heard, 
And the city of Houston has no authority over the public schools. Um, the school system in the region is incredibly fragmented. There are a number of different school districts and they all set their own policies at the boards of directors. So the only way to influence that policy is to influence those individuals or who is sitting on the boards of directors of the school system. And that's, that's a challenge. You could maybe try state policy, but in HISD, for example, the largest school system that we have, um, they have a concept of site-based management. And so you can't do a lot of top-down implementation of policy um, in that kind of structure. It's a huge hurdle. Um, the, um, the costs of going in and subsidizing programs uh, through private funding is, I think, not, not a realistic expectation. Um, the, the only way to really influence um, a lot and make sure all children are covered is through policy change and the, the school districts to direct their own public dollars accordingly. One thing I just wanted to point out is something that Reginald and I were talking about it earlier is we're, we're both artists, but we, we started out in the nonprofit sector, but we are both for profit now. I, I work, I have a company that I produce movies professionally. Um, I'm not gonna say who for, but I will say I do get paid to make movies, which is very unusual here in Houston. I know Reginald is on a similar path with his work. So it's, for me, if I hadn't have had that nonprofit background, if I hadn't have had that education and that network and the access to, you know, to, you know, see films and experience them and meet the filmmakers and that that tangible experience of that over the course of the eight years, you know, influenced me heavily and sort of helped me get on that path to where I could be doing this professionally. I mean, that's a valuable, and that's the kind of thing that I think that nonprofits, you know, could really do to affect the larger the larger arts, um, you know, not just the community, but also the the artists individually through you know getting their helping getting their work out there and giving them the resources they need to be able to do this for a living. Um, yeah, I completely agree, and I wanted to add on like I think what we should probably be talking about is the demo the democratization of education. So you know more education for more people so that they can appreciate the arts and all sorts of other things as well. Um, that's where I think the real democratization needs to happen. It, it does put, um, we'll go over there first and then come back here. So um, it does put the artist in this position to be a case maker, um, as well as the, you know, in sort of in collaboration with the cultural organizations, um, given, you know, the recognition that that top down system just, you know, isn't permeable in any way. Yes. Hi, thank you all for, for speaking today. Um, so it seems that we all can agree that art making should be available to everyone, that everyone should be um, able to make art if they are so inclined. And everyone should be able to see art or experience art if they're so inclined. But I think what I, I'm hoping the panelists could speak to is there's a, a gigantic gulf between those two, between being an artist and being an audience member. And I wonder how we can think about democratizing the institutions that decide who is an artist, who is a dilettante, and who is um, someone worthy of being shown in a museum. Um, thank you. Do you want to go? Sure. I think probably step one would be more diversity, you know, at the top, obviously. So the who gets to say what is art and what is not is no longer, you know, white men. Um, especially at MoMA, it was white men educated at Harvard. Um, did they have broad ranging views of modernism? Absolutely. Is that influential? It was. Um, but yeah, of course, there's always room and, you know, incrementally, unfortunately, you know, I think progress has been made. The curator, the head curator at MoMA today is a woman. Um, but. Yeah, I think more diversity at the top for people of color, for women, um, gay, straight, lesbian, everything. So that, that's probably, I don't know how to accomplish that, but that's where I would start. Anybody else? So I 
had the privilege of arts education growing up, and I will still say that I resented it. It was sanitized, it was Eurocentric, and I identified more with um, what was being created that was avant-garde and that was interesting and that kind of pushed those limits. Then again, I was exposed to an education that allowed me to seek that kind of work, but I found that I enjoyed my community organizations and the museums more, and that it's possible to kind of allow the energy that is that happens in the avant-garde realm more, to radiate more quickly because of the conversations are quicker. I'll have lingo that I say with my friends that I think is a part of you know black female culture, and then next week it'll be on BuzzFeed, and then Momo will do a retrospective on it by the time <laughs> the year is over. So those conversations and that transmission is happening more quickly. And I do think that because of that, museums do need to be more responsive to be relevant. Yeah. Let's move to the back, and then we'll come back over here, if that's OK. We had two hands up here. Did you guys want to say anything? Just a quick uh, follow-up to the, the leadership comment. Um, one of the uh, programming that was out of the Getty uh, started in the 90s that I had a little bit of a problem with when it was launched, but I think it's been very successful, is an internship program, national internship program, um, for uh, non-Anglo um, students of art history. And um, it's probably 15 or 20 years old now. I don't know where Roberto is, but he may have been at the Getty when it was uh, first launched. Where is he? Red, that's a yes. Okay. I have some fingerprints on that one. Okay. Um, well, okay, he's running away. I actually wanted to know his comments uh, on the program and the impact of the program. I've personally seen over the years now uh, brilliant people coming out of that program that have really changed the, the way that organizations, cultural organizations, are now operating because of the great diversity. So just a general comment. Yeah, I just want to interject. You know, I know it's the leadership at the top, but I also know that we serve on peer panels. And you know what I mean? We, we engage in the infrastructure ourselves variously, and I think we constantly have to push ourselves to think, are we heading down the same path, or are we going down a new direction? You know what I mean? Because I, the system that's established by the 50s on is, is one that is um, using peer panels as a mechanism throughout. And I feel like sometimes there is um, natural fear about inviting people in, new people in, to the process. That we do um, have a tendency to gravitate towards like-minded and um, people who understand us and get us. And so that is going to take intentional effort to invite new voices in and um, maybe even let them hold up a mirror to our work. Um, that we've been doing on these peer panels and in these museums um, and be willing to listen um, a little more. If I can, I want to I want to pose a question just by show of hands. How many of y'all have been to a candidate's forum before where an elected official is being questioned or held accountable? So that's about a little more than half the room. How many of y'all have heard the candidate's forum uh, being asked about anything art related? So it's a much smaller group. My, 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 my interest in posing that question is, rarely do we even bring that as a topic of, of focus when we're looking at elected officials. And yet these are the individuals who are making the policies that are kind of guiding the direction of our schools and our communities and the economic development in our, in our cities. And I think that's a responsibility that the arts community can hold is, will we hold a candidate's forum for the next mayor? that's centric around arts and creativity. Yeah. 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 June 3rd. June 3rd. June 3rd. Yes. Where? Asian Society coming out. Asian Society, right. June 3rd, 6 to 8 p.m. Asian Society, June 3rd, 6 to 8 p.m. Okay, great. My name is Jacob, and uh, well, I'm an employee at this restaurant called Hollis. And well, it seems like there's been a very um, unfair uh, talk about uh, art being uh, 
visual, uh, auditory, and uh, visionary art of being the uh, poetry and other books like that. What about culinary art of, like, let's say, food? Because, uh, well, that's one of the oldest forms of art there is in this world. How come people don't talk more about art in, in the food section? Because after all, in the Museum of Fine Arts, there's a restaurant in the building, and then um, by the Jones Hall, there's uh, restaurants around there, and then um, the, by the Manil Collection, there's another restaurant by there that they chronicled in an article on. And um, so, um, well, there are lots of eateries, restaurants by the museum district. And so I was wondering why people um, don't think about the food as an art form. Actually, I think we do. I mean, they're preparing lunch now, right? And we're all <laughs> waiting for it. Um, I, I think the fact that there's Obviously. over 10,000 restaurants in Houston uh, affirms that food as a culinary art form is very much celebrated in Houston. And you can eat just about any food from any corner of the world. Uh, perhaps the fact that it's not uh, institutionalized or you don't see exhibitions or installations around art, uh, maybe that's why we don't necessarily think about it as a culinary art form, but uh, I, I would say that um, the food is something that plays a part in every one of our lives, of course, and it's very much celebrated in Houston. Uh, it just probably fits outside the context of what most people perceive as art. I, I think you're also, but it is a great point to say that we are constantly challenging ourselves now to not stick to the old disciplines. You know, almost every, so many artists are not just saying I'm a dancer, but you know, it becomes the hyphenate. I'm the dancer writer, the dancer poet. Um, it becomes the transdisciplinary artist, the anti-disciplinary artist. There's a lot of language about it, and we need to be, remember to think about food in those contexts all the time, too. Um, did, were you wanting to pick that up? No. Okay. Yeah. All the way there. Um, I kind of want to circle back around to the um, arts education and the public schools. Um, a lot of, I don't necessarily agree that it has to start with the top and trickle down. I think it's important to do the policies, but um, I think inspiring, uh, oh, inspiring individuals and parents to action. I think the policies will follow. I created a Saturday arts workshop between three schools. The responsibility was shared. Kids who were interested from all three schools could come to all of these. It was fun, the funding, the funding was shared between schools and um, community. A couple of hundred bucks. We had amazing art programs. Um, and I think if we could, if the roles of these art, of the arts leaders could inspire the individuals to take action and demand it, I think we could, I think the policies could follow. So I think it is a combination of treetops and grassroots. But what I've seen inevitably is when a leader within an organization or a municipality makes a stand in support of the arts, the, the rest tend to follow, right? So if the superintendent of Houston's public schools said that the arts are critical to the education of our youth, you'll see principals, you'll see counselors, you'll see administrators refocus towards satisfying their leader. And along with parents getting more involved in community folks and people like those who are in this room, I think it's very much a combination, but if that leader doesn't prioritize the creativity in their institution or their business, then it's harder for it to rise from the bottom. And I just wanted to uh, say something real quick. The, to ping off what Reginald had said about getting um, council members and that kind of thing, at the arts uh, open town hall that we all, a lot of us were at a couple of weeks ago, um, a great idea was floated by Tony, Tony Diaz, which was to have 
each district have a different kind of core or sub group of art people and which is a great way to go and i know manette took note of that so i just want to put that out there again because that's a great idea that we can all champion our city council members to kind of follow up with that idea and then the other thing real quick is our culinary advocate over there who i love i can't remember his name we just spoke um, there's it's such a great there are 11,000 restaurants in this city so it's a great opportunity to connect arts organizations with restaurants I and mean, we all know these people that run restaurants and there's a really close relationship and Houston inspired had something that they were going to do with that and I don't know what happened but I really think that we all need to follow up on that because it's a great way to, to partner up with arts organizations thank you we have time for just about one more question in this section. Can you come back to the center? Um, go there. Yeah. So quick question. Thanks, Pamela. It's been a great, great discussion. I have a question, maybe mostly for Sandra, about the success of MoMA when the gallery apparently failed. If you take ongoing presence as a measure of success, I'd love it if you could speak a little bit more to what, what was it that enabled MoMA to succeed? And what does that tell us about um, the decision makers around inclusion and exclusion and whether they are becoming more or less democratic? Uh, that's a really, really good question. Um, and one that I'm not sure, I'm not sure I can put my finger on MoMA's formula for success, but they, are, for, for something that's perceived as difficult, modern and contemporary art, they have such an amazing um, amount of attendees every year, which I think is around four million. I mean, it's, it's big. It's not as big as the Met, but I think it's like the second biggest uh, in New York, or museum in New York. Um, they are doing more populist shows. They, uh, I think, just are, they have a show of Bjork. I don't know if Bjork counts as populist, actually. Um, okay, <laughs> Tim Burton. Um, so they're moving more toward film, and I think, you know, in a way that, that reflects back to their early history, like when MoMA was founded in 1929, you would never consider film to be art. Um, the fact that the photo department wasn't founded until 1940 is interesting because it's so late, but it's still the first photo department in a museum, and photography is very much sort of something vernacular. You're talking about how, you know, films today are opening up because people have the means to produce them themselves, but photography was like, perhaps the first art that allowed regular people with minimal technical skills to produce visual images. Um, so maybe MoMA's embracing its early history, and, and other than that, I can only say, I do think there's some intangible force where people are interested in the idea of high culture. Um, not that we can't change what high culture is, but I think people are attracted to the idea of it. Um, and maybe MoMA's really worked that balance quite well. But I don't know, I'm open, I would love to hear what other people have to say. Oh, I think we're gonna take a couple more questions. Great. Sweet. Hi, uh, I'm, I would like to talk more about art education and what Reginald was discussing. I recently moved from San Antonio to the Valley, uh, which is lower Texas for for those of you who are not familiar, and um, speaking in, in plain terms, it's behind in the times. There is no art education in the schools. Uh, the community is not aware of art. We have, uh, my boyfriend and myself moved down there, opened up a studio and gallery, and we open it to the public every last Friday of the month. And um, the response from the community has really blown my mind because they have never been exposed to fine art, high art. Uh, they have many museums around the area that have not seen um, fine art pieces. They don't get good collections. They don't have the budget. And I'm learning, I'm learning as, um, as uh, someone who works for a nonprofit, I'm the sole, uh, sole employee of a nonprofit organization that is the Texas Sculpture Group, <laughs> which is a part of the ISC, the International Sculpture Center. So I work nonprofit, and now I feel like it's my responsibility um, and the community's responsibility to educate the younger people about art. It's not the higher ups or museums, it's actually a community responsibility. 
where you need to get everybody involved. And um, very recently, I've been trying to put together a community art event, and most half of the people that were on my board have backed out because of lack of interest, lack of funds, and it's not um, it's not an expensive thing that we're trying to do. It's like a talk it up program that's in San Antonio run by Art Pace or uh, the one in Houston, but it's actually been upsetting me how uninvolved our communities are in the South with the arts and trying to introduce an entire region to fine art. It has been very difficult, but it's, um, it's very rewarding. Being a part of the community to help move that and make it like everybody aware. I think there's no doubt that the um, arts ed education in America at large, but especially, I mean, equally here in Houston, is, is challenging because the schools are already stra strapped for funding and those resources are being spread very thinly and that's where I feel like uh, nonprofits can really step in and fill that gap. Uh, when I worked for Swamp, I for three years I taught after school programs, filmmaking classes, and uh, I, at a, a key middle school, I call it middle school here in town, you know, the, those schools, uh, wonderful kids. Those kids taught me more than I ever taught them. But the amazing thing was that most of them had never had a camera put in their hand and told how to use it to tell a story. And, and it's that rudimentary just getting that, that access, you know, to get that access to be able to, to take something and, and tell a story, tell about their lives, tell about, you know, most of them, like, I related to the mom here just talking about Beyonce because, you know, when I was teaching the after school programs, they all wanted to make, like, you know, American Idol, and because you know, that's what they relate to uh, on, in the media. You know, that's what they were wanting to replicate. So part of my job was to take that sort of seed of interest they had, but merge it to, to make it so they can make it their own and get their own voices out there. And, um, and that was always a challenge, you know, semester by semester, but the kids ultimately just really, you know, they, they um, you know, embraced that because it was giving them a chance to do something they never had, had done before. And I think so, you know, the after school is one, one avenue, but also I think mentorship is something that's vital, not just for the, the youth, but just for the, the community at large. Anyone wanting to, uh, to learn, uh, you know, this art form and learn it from people who've gone through the, those, you know, those stages and have, have, you know, made the mistakes and have, you know, developed themselves, their craft, and to be able to, to get out there and find that audience, help that next person out who's coming up and be that mentor. Maybe not tell them how to do their art so much, but just to let them know that, that you know, what they're doing is, is interesting and, and what, they, what you like and what you don't like about what they're doing because, because ultimately that's just gonna help them figure out what, you know, how to, how to find that, that audience, you know, to, to build that, that work of art that's really going to get Get their get attention. I just want to give a plug for Roberto's book at this moment. Just to, to go to the place, the your report to some place, um, which can be found online. Because I think he had, he presents a case of merging art and culture so much um, that the two are sort of understand in really integrated ways, and it offers really provocative case studies for the kind of work you're you're talking about and the challenges you're facing. So you know we kind of have some great resources even now, or especially now. Yes. I just, uh, I'm sorry. I just want to, since we're on a university campus, yeah. um, not forget that there is a role of, for universities and colleges in the K through 12 system, and that if in their admission practices and policies, universities valued arts credits and looked for them in their admissions, that would help influence what happens lower down. Uh, I'm Vega Tonwijk. I wanted to respond to what Michelle brought up. I'm very passionate about education. I understand about schools. I raised three children. Uh, there was a 10 year gap between the two oldest and the youngest. And the, the crush or the crash of culture, uh, cultural education in the school was just shocking. Um, I understand the problems of the schools. I understand the, the cemented opinions of school boards, I fought that uh, back and forth because uh, indeed band always won over orchestra 
uh, as if we want to change something here, this is very important. We also, as artists and arts leaders, need to go out to the schools and volunteer and create programs because this is all very meaningful and very important. But I, my passion is always we need to do something, we need to reach out, otherwise in the future our beautiful halls will be empty. Houston is an amazing city. I'm just passionate about this city. There's so much happening. But we also live in this shallow culture of selfies and uh, public figures like Kim Kardashian. Who is she? You know, we we looked up to Catherine Hepper, and fortunately their scandals were hidden. But it's it's everything is very shallow. But if we don't show it to these children, then they they can't relate. So that's my point. Thank you, Sixto. There's someone behind you. Or do we are we out of time or? One last, one last question. one? Okay, last question. Thank you very much. Hi. Um, I just want to say one thing that I know the education problem is a big problem, and I appreciate that, and I know that everyone here is very passionate. Um, one thing that we did in our family and that I grew up doing that I think is something each individual can do with their own children that I found very successful, and we did a good citizenship uh, allowance in our family where with our child, we gave him $75 a month if he was a good student and child where $25 of that money was his own, $25 was an investment for his future that he had to put into an investment, and $25 he had to donate to some kind of arts foundation every month of his life for his whole life. So he had to go out and see a play, he had to go out to the orchestra, he had to go out to an art museum, and he had to give $25 a month to some art organization. Now I know a lot of you have jobs, you are a part of an organization, you work 12 to 15 hours a day. It's not always easy to go give your time to a school, to go give your time to some kind of organization. But if you have a child, you can force your child to go once a month <laughs> to a play, to an art museum, to an orchestra, and say, I'm gonna give you $25 a month, and you pick an organization to donate to. So there are ways to still make your children be participants. So there are other ways to do it when you say, my God, how am I gonna give 10 hours a month to a school? Well, there are ways to do it, and you can tell your neighbors to do the same thing with their children when they're not getting educated in a school. There are other alternative options to still get children involved in the arts and make them feel like they're giving. And that's an important thing to teach. So that's just something I know we've always done, and our child goes to plays now by himself. And he's 17. <laughs> and he's not always thrilled, but he goes. <laughs> just on his own. So I think there's other alternatives. One other thing I wanted to say about the democratization of art that I think is very important that we're talking about. Um, we're talking about, you know, um, whether or not, uh, you know, how to get audiences, you know, people's, everybody should see art, everybody should go, or how we balance that, that, um, that uh, I don't know what the right word is, but I think it's very important, this is, to me, I mean, part of my mission, I run a theater company, and part of my mission is that artists are paid. And in my company, if my artist isn't paid a living wage as an artistic director, I'm not paid a living wage. And I believe very strongly that artists should be paid. You know, most of us that are artists have a, you know, bachelor's degree or we have a master's degree. So I think it's very important when we're talking about this issue that we don't eliminate the idea that just because everybody should see art, that we don't make art all free. Because people in the public need to be educated that artists deserve to be paid. We worked very hard for our educations. And if people start believing that they should just see art for free, then they stop paying for art. It doesn't mean they have to pay a lot. But if they pay $5 and they realize that people are paid, when you come to, you know, when you make them understand that, hey, it's a, I feel good about paying for art. If they start to understand that you, you educate them, that, hey, I paid for this artist to do this, they start to feel good about their contribution. There's a way to do that. And I, and I worry when people start conversations that say, oh, it should all be free, everybody should be able to go. Yes, they should be able to go, but they should, they should also be educated. Audiences aren't educated, and that's, that's very frightening to me that when we start to talk about this conversation that there's not an education to an audience about what art means and what it costs to create it and what somebody's education level is who's giving it to you. And Thank that's you. an important thing. Thank you. We're ending on a really nice note about stewardship. Um, it's time, actually. Um, one last thing. We have a new question that we want to show. Um, and this question actually came from Cornerstone Theater's work and was brought to our attention from Cecilia White, one of the student leadership board members. Um, 
What is your go-to interactive strategy? Did I do that one? Yep. Is it still there? It's the next one. Sorry, we, the, the go-to interactive strategy was up when I went to check it. Is that correct? So uh, it will be up in just a second. Um, I think that there is an awful lot of passion in the room and a lot of questions and a lot of conversation that needs to happen. Um, we've heard about education, about stewardship. This is a time and in terms of break to grab your lunch to continue those conversations and hopefully at 12.10 we will start talking about the next session. Let's thank our panel.